All right. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome, welcome. We'll give everyone a few minutes to log in, establish their connection. It's great to see our attendee count kind of jump up there. Welcome to the Q3 uh, 2023 ADOT Joint DBE Task Force meeting. It's a mouthful, trying to say all that at the same time. <laughs> My name is Rebecca Morris. I'll be your, your MC for today. Uh, and I do have a presentation to, to share with everyone. Uh, while we get everything kind of settled in and get going, please do take a moment. Uh, feel free to drop your name, your company name, your role into uh, the chat. And be sure to note, uh, there is a little drop down. If you want to send the chat to everyone, then you can kind of see everybody that is here. Kenny, good morning. Good to see you. Good morning. Kenny, I'm going to have you turn your camera off. Hey, there you go. <laughs> Step into the background, if you will. Good morning, Stephanie. Good morning, Priyanka. Good morning, Howard with Ardura. So again, as everybody kind of gets logged in, uh, feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. Uh, that is a great place to drop your name, but, um, oh, um, your company name, your role, anything uh, you'd like to say good morning uh, in the chat. That's a great place to do it. I love to see all the good mornings rolling in. In a virtual event, that is like the, the most connection we can offer in terms of networking value. All right, well, let's go ahead and call this meeting to order. Uh, again, my name is Rebecca Morris, Arizona Builders Exchange. Uh, I am your event organizer for ADOT. I also do have a, a big presentation to share with you today. Uh, as we get going, uh, please do, again, use the chat. Those kind of the comments, those are great for rolling comments, you know, names, introductions, little chat. If you have a specific question to the panel or to myself, anything that talks about the content and the program that we're using today that we're presenting, please do use the Q&A. So that's a little bit different than the chat that enables us to kind of hold the question. So in some cases, we've seen questions like, oh, we're coming to that. Uh, we don't want to lose track of it. Or if it fits, you know, to hold that question till the end, that's definitely something we want to do. Um, so again, please use the Q&A for questions about presentation materials, uh, anything you have a question to the panel, to the speakers, anything like that. Uh, use the Q&A. The chat, again, that's great for you know comments. That's great for you know chatting. That's what it's meant for is to kind of connect with with others that are uh, on the line. So first up, I'd like to invite Francesca Martin uh, to turn on her camera and her microphone. Francesca Martin is with DBE Supportive Services. She is our Small Business and Workforce Development Officer. Francesca, do you have anything to give us an update? Any ADOT updates today? Yes. Thank you, Rebecca. Good morning and welcome, everyone. So just wanted to share that our DBE and Small Business uh, Conference is coming back in person. So we're looking for everyone who are looking for preparing for upcoming work, or if you're looking to uh, connect with primes, uh, procuring agencies, um, statewide exhibitors, panel discussions, breakout sessions, we have it all. It's October 3rd and 4th, and it's at the Casino Del Sol Conference Center in Tucson, Arizona. So we definitely encourage you to register. Uh, it's going to be a great event. We also have the follow-up workshop session to this task force meeting. It's on August 29th. It's at 9 a.m. And it's the do's and don'ts and responding to the RFPs. And, I'm sorry, RFQs and IFBs. So definitely take a look at the registration link and get registered for that so you can have all that information available to you. Um, as always, if you have any questions related to uh, DBE supportive services and any of our upcoming events, you can definitely reach us. I'll put that link in the chat. Um, also, please subscribe to our newsletter where you will stay connected and informed of everything that we have going on in the upcoming months. And that's all I have, Rebecca. Thank you. Thank you very much, Francesca. And I think I saw, if you want to stay for just a second, I think I saw the DBE conference registration is no charge. Is that right? That is correct. It is. Oh. And we do have sponsorship of, um, uh, benefits available. So we will include all of that information in the link and it will direct you right to that information. Fantastic. Yeah, that's a great conference. 
multi-day free event. Geez, can't beat that. All right, thank you so much. Uh, so next up, so first up, I should say, before we get into the panel hearing from our top owners in the state, uh, Francesca, I don't know if you want to turn your camera off, um, but I will actually give you kind of everything that I love talking about, which is show me the money. So I do give this presentation often. Again, my name is Rebecca Morris. I'm with the Arizona Builders Exchange, or BEX. Uh, we like to talk capital funding. So that is one of our favorite things to do. Uh, so I've got a presentation. I'll run through the top 10. Uh, you do get the slides. So no need to take screenshots. We will PDF them and I will send them out. Uh, we will send them out to everyone who is registered. So whether you made the event live or if uh, anybody wasn't able to make it, we'll certainly distribute the link to the video. Uh, we are recording this, obviously. And a PDF of all the slide decks because that's good information. So with that, let's kind of get going. Uh, there we go. All right, so top things that we're going to cover today. We're gonna to talk about how large the construction industry is in Arizona. We have metrics on that. We have raw data. We love we love our data, kind of a data geek. Uh, I'll jump into that here in a moment. Uh, what portion of the market is public works? So how does that break down? How does infrastructure or public works fit into the bigger scheme of the entire construction industry or construction market in Arizona? Uh, our top 10 capital programs, we do these David Letterman style. And then procurement analysis and kind of some current market conditions, a couple of outlook statements on the overall market. So with that, Statewide construction activity. This is really cool. Uh, the Department of Revenue is where we get our numbers from. Uh, over here, I have the resource for you. If you've never played on azeconomy.org, highly recommend it. It is one of the, well, you can get lost in the rabbit hole of data, but statistics and numbers and raw data. So we use this a lot um, and we can pull Department of Revenue numbers for actual construction activity. It is a taxable activity. So we use sales tax or taxable uh, construction activity. Uh, big things to note, 2006 was our high point, uh, $21.7 billion in construction activity statewide. That is the size of the market. And then how far did we go? Kind of a low point, if you will, 2010 was $8.4 billion, drop of over 60%. And then the, the really cool thing, 2022 was the first time we eclipsed our pre-recession boom. So 2022, we did eclipse $22.4 billion dollars in total statewide construction activity. So very, very cool metric there. That is the size of the pie. If you ever wondered, you know, how big is the market? What's our total market activity? This is it, $22.4 billion in total statewide construction activity. A uh, really fun thing to play with just to see how the market changes over time. This is the exact same data, just kind of flipped. So let's, let's talk about rate of change. So in the, in the recession of 2008, 9, and 10, you're dropping 30% year over year. In three years consecutive de revenue declines, right? Market shrinking, so very significant. We felt that if you were in business. I started my company right here in 2010. <laughs> so I kind of know what that's like. It was, uh, honestly, I'm, I'm relieved that I did because I, I needed to learn a lot of lessons. Uh, but then it, we really started kind of bumping around 2011 through 2016, kind of slow growth. 2015 dropped a bunch, back up a little bit. 2017 is really where we started to take off. So ever since 2017, 18, 19, and 20, at least 10% year over year growth. If you look at that accumulation of growth, you're looking at nearly doubling the size of the market. 2021, you'll notice there was very little. We notched like 1.9% growth. Uh, that's because the market was absolutely constrained. So 2021, we felt that, right? You couldn't get materials. You couldn't get people out there. COVID had a huge impact. There was supply chain issues. Everything was hitting all at the same time. We're absolutely stuck. And then what happened in 22, 2022, uh, kind of released, all those pressures eased, all those constraints kind of eased. We notched 24.1% growth in the total market activity. So revenue, uh, that's what the size of the market did in 2022, 24% growth. That's enormous. It's kind of cool. So looking at that, that's the total size of the pie. And then within that, how do things break down? We do consider housing. So single family, residential, and multifamily. We do track commercial, so all real estate, whether it's uh, industrial, manufacturing, healthcare, um, hospitality, restaurants, retail, everything, office, all of that is considered commercial. Then infrastructure for us, we look at public works, so any type of publicly funded construction. This is your breakdown. So what was really interesting is when I started doing this, this exact analysis about seven, eight years ago, it was beautiful. It was one third, one third, one third. 
So really interesting. There was housing was a third, public works was a third, commercial was a third. And then things really started changing in about 2019, 20, actually 2018 or so. It really started changing. Commercial really started growing. The overall market was still growing. I already showed you that slide where we said it was matching at least 10% year over year growth. What happened? Infrastructure is still growing. Public works is growing. I will show you all the details for our top 10 programs here in a moment, uh, but it couldn't keep pace with commercial real estate development. So you can see those when you see the news about Intel and TSMCs, those monster or mega projects coming into the state. Uh, that's really what's, what's making the market grow. Those are such big projects. They are so enormous. Uh, they're really driving the market forward, uh, all the multifamily projects, everything. Infrastructure is growing, like I said, but it just can't keep pace or couldn't keep pace with the rate of growth of commercial private real estate development. Uh, a couple notes on funding. So this is what we're going to talk about for the rest of the time. Now we've kind of talked about the overall market. We've kind of understand, we've understood how they kind of fit together, the private side, the public side, and housing. Now let's talk funding for the rest of the time. So a couple notes on funding. Uh, our state agencies are very much reliant on federal funds. So we do, we do receive an enormous amount of federal funds that fund construction. So that's really what I'm talking about here. Uh, a lot of those federal funds come through ADOT or operating funds. And then at the state level, we do not like to fund capital projects from the general fund. That is not our thing. That is as, just as a state, that it is just not what we do. Uh, we do see that. Um, we do have, you know, if you look at the ADOA, the state level, the Arizona Department of Administration, they do set out a facilities, kind of a state of the state facilities. Uh, it's kind of desperate, you know, the need for capital funding for state facilities. Uh, we're really not good at that. Also, if you look at something like K-12, so K-12, our public schools are reliant on the State Department of Education and the State uh, Arizona School Facilities Board to fund capital projects. We're very bad at that. So that's kind of my conclusion. Just as a state, we don't like to allocate state funding for capital projects. Uh, we make schools kind of go after bonds, uh, all those different mechanisms for funding capital projects. Looking at regional and local municipalities now, we actually have a lot more tools. So we look at sales tax, we look at property taxes, we look at enterprise funds, so all those user-driven funds. So whether it's water, wastewater, Mesa has power. Mesa is a local municipality that provides power kind of unique. So all those user funds, the enterprise funds definitely fund our capital projects. We do use bonds. That's a tool at the, at the local and regional level. Uh, and then in the past couple of years, we've had a lot of federal stimulus funds come into our uh, local municipalities. So that's kind of what we do. All right, let's talk top 10. So I do these David Letterman style just because I think it's fun. Uh, coming in at number 10 this year, Maricopa County. We've got 1.067 billion in their five-year total. That is a decline. That is our biggest decline, kind of our, our biggest uh, decline in five-year total for funding. Uh, they're down 37.55% year over year. Town of Queen Creek, almost $1.1 billion. They're up nearly 13%. Number eight, City of Chandler, $1.2 billion. They're up 25.8%. City of Tempe, $1.5 billion. They're up 12.71%. City of Tucson, $1.585 billion, up 2.81%. City of Mesa, $1.89 billion, up 8.33%. Town of Gilbert, $2.137 billion, up nearly 22% in their five-year total. Number three, City of Scottsdale, $2.357 billion. They're up 15.9% year over year. ADOT, this is a monster increase. This is your biggest increase for the year, $9.566 billion in their five-year uh, state transportation improvement plan, up 41%. And then City of Phoenix, they, they cleared $10 billion. I've never seen that before, up 2.47% in their five-year total. So kind of overall, just massive conclusions, you know, just looking at this, you know, kind of at a glance, you had to clear a billion dollars just to make the top 10. So that's, Kind of wild. Um, we've never seen that before. It's definitely a state of increase. So I can tell you overall public works, our funding and capital programs is on the rise. Uh, we've never seen all 10 clear a billion dollars in the five-year total. That's, that's kind of wild. So definitely a, a good time um, in terms of funding levels. They are at kind of all-time highs. Honorable mentions, we do track about the top 35 or so. So I kind of put the last uh, five or so. Sometimes these pop in and out of the top 10. Uh, Valley Metro, we, we've got that pegged at $1 billion. 
uh, and then Glendale, Peoria, and Goodyear kind of round out your top 14 or so. So that's kind of the, the top capital programs across the state. We are still waiting for final programs. So all those little asterisks, you'll see those throughout the presentation, uh, we're waiting on final programs. So even though they took effect July 1, we have not gotten final documents. So we're either using last year's numbers or we are using preliminary or approved numbers that we have from presentations kind of in the, in the spring of 2023. Oh, one more, there it is, Town of Buckeye. All right, and then I use this slide, I, this is our top 10 again, uh, just kind of putting it into context, I like to kind of explain the scale, uh, really big kind of conclusions again, Phoenix and ADOT kind of dwarf everybody else. So even though every single one of our top 10 has a full billion dollars in their five-year total, City of Phoenix and ADOT off to the left, you know, they're, they're just these monster programs. So very large municipalities, very large capital programs. Uh, and then they do kind of, like I said, dwarf everybody else. Um, about 20, I think it was 2018, 2017, maybe Kenny can clarify, uh, Phoenix did eclipse ADOT. When we started, ADOT was always the top program, always have the most in their five-year plan. And then about 2018, I think it was 2017 or 2018, uh, Phoenix kind of crossed them, and then they really never looked back. So Phoenix has continued to increase uh, their capital program, the volume or the size of their capital program. All right, I'm going to skim through, really skim through City of Phoenix, ADOT, and Scottsdale only because they are your panel. Uh, anything I say is going to be completely overridden by anything they say. Uh, that, that's who you want to listen to, is, is listen direct from the source. Uh, I did put together these slides for every single one of our top 10 capital programs. So across the bottom, you can just see we've done this for a long time, tracking the five-year totals. Uh, so the bars are just going to give you the five-year total, and then this line chart just tells you the rate of change. So really impactful, and I'm going to kind of point this out where I can, is new funding measures lead to increased capital program size. So when you're talking City of Phoenix, really looking at T2050 is one of the biggest drivers of capital uh, funding. So I believe that passed back in 2015. Kenny is probably going to tell me better. Uh, but you can see really big increases over here. So that's really what's driving that. Uh, and again, they cost $10 billion. You've really seen a massive increase in capital funding since about 2018. 2017, 2018 is really when you see those large increases, high percentage year over year growth, uh, which is really incredible. A couple of interesting projects I pulled from their CIP. Uh, you'll get the slides, so I'll kind of let you digest those later. Their five-year program is final. It is online. It is available for everyone to grab. Uh, definitely some good research there. Uh, moving on to ADOT, uh, they've been kind of the longest, very steady eddy kind of program. They were always right around five to six billion dollars, uh, right around, I think it was, 2022. Really saw a big increase uh, last year, and then the monster increase this year. This is significant. A really, really large increase in their capital funding and their state transportation improvement plan. A couple notes on that. Again, it is the largest increase year over year, and that's really coming from federal funding. So really interesting or big impact to our capital spend, to our capital program. Uh, Prop 400E, it was approved and signed by the governor. It is coming back to voters. So that's one big issue there that will lead to uh, funding for transportation projects. The other note here, uh, sunset. So alternative project delivery methods, I'll touch on this again at the end. So our use of APDM or construction manager at risk and design build and job order contracting. Specifically for ADOT, I believe that's Title 28 and that sunset exists. So in that Title 28 of Arizona Revised Statutes, there is a sunset built into that. Essentially says you can't enter into new contracts after December 31st, 2025, and that's ADOT specifically. Uh, so I'll drop that link into my slide deck at the end um, if you want to read about it a little bit more. So that's kind of one of those issues that's coming. And moving on to Scottsdale. Uh, Scottsdale, again, had a really kind of a not a great capital program until 2019 when they finally passed general obligation bonds. So big funding measure. If you see 2019 here, kind of, you know, not great, kind of bumping around. Massive increases starting in 2020. So that's one of the really big drivers of capital funding. Uh, just making a note there, again, we have a 15.9% increase year over year. Uh, it's really the bond funding. So up until that bond passed, they were unique in that they used uh, general fund monies to fund capital programs, capital spend. Uh, that was very unique. That was different from other municipalities. Now you have a lot more, more regular, more consistent funding mechanisms for, for uh, capital projects through the city of Scottsdale. 
All right, Town of Gilbert. I'm putting these little notes up here. If we're waiting on their final program, I'm going to call that out just so you know that may change. So these I would take as preliminary numbers. Um, I am using last year's numbers. We are more than $2 billion for the Town of Gilbert in their five-year spend. They, I think they put together a 10-year program. Uh, so five-year spend, they are looking, or they uh, one of their major funding sources is a, is a bond in 2021. We had $515 million bond for transportation that barely passed voters. That was squeaking by, barely, barely came by. A big thing to note for the Town of Gilbert, 90% of it goes to parks, streets, water, and wastewater. So your major food groups, if you will, uh, at the town of Gilbert, those are your major food groups in terms of types of projects. Uh, the town of Gilbert did present earlier this year. Like I said, we're waiting on their final book. Um, this is direct from them. So this is direct from a presentation they gave earlier this year around April. So it's their approved CIP. And they do, again, put together a 10-year plan. Uh, so when they put their numbers together, it's 10 years, it's nearly $5 billion. These are the types of projects. So again, they have a ton of money over in Parks and Rec, a lot of water projects, and a lot of streets projects. City of Mesa. Interesting thing here is I think they kind of chunk down their, their ask of voters. So they, they come out with medium to me. It's a huge municipality. It's a huge city. Um, but they don't kind of lump all their bond questions in together. They kind of ask for specific things, but they ask a little bit more regularly than I see other cities doing. So they kind of go up and down in their capital programs. Uh, they get fun the funding via bond measures, and then they spend the funding via delivering projects. So really interesting thing to watch. They're a little bit unique in that they have a very consistent drip of bond kind of funding, and then they deliver their projects. So we do have a five-year total of $1.89 billion. Uh, they did have a public safety bond most recently in 2022, and then they are looking at a geo bond again in 2024. These are the types of projects that they are looking to do. This is direct from the city of Mesa. So this is their five-year capital program. Uh, just in terms of where they allocate their funds, a lot of white water and wastewater projects, a lot of transportation projects. So that's a lot. City of Mesa is a little bit unique. I mentioned they supply power. So that is a user fund for them. They supply power and gas, natural gas. That is very unique. Uh, I don't think anyone else does that in terms of cities. Uh, they really don't have that. Um, and, and so this is unique to the city of Mesa. City of Tucson, again, we're waiting on their five-year capital program, the approved capital program from this year. Uh, last year, we do have $1.584 billion. It is a 23.16% increase. Uh, looking at transportation tax, down in the region of Pima County, there's a lot of discussion, a lot of efforts to pass something that is legal. I believe the last one is still caught up in battles on whether the legality of the transportation tax, um, all that good stuff, that'll slow things down right down. Um, but that is kind of the discussion down in Pima County is transportation sales tax. Uh, so we do see those kind of winding down. Uh, from the five, from their five-year plan, they really need to spend and uh, really want to spend their capital funds on transportation and water. Those are the areas that they allocate the most funds towards. Moving on, City of Tempe, uh, they did clear $1.4 billion in their five-year spend. I love to see these graphs when they kind of just kind of slowly increase, right? They have some good increases. They have some good, consistent, steady uh, revenue increases for um the city of Tempe. A couple notes on them. We've got 12.71% increase. They're cleared by 1.5 billion, excuse me. And then really they're still feeling the effects of the 2020 bond. That was $350 million, $349 million in new funding uh, for capital programs that absolutely is feeding their, their uh, capital program there. A couple of notes from them. Again, they're looking at allocating money into transportation, transit, water, and wastewater. It's a lot of water and wastewater across the board. Uh, a lot of our municipalities are investing in that type of work. City of Chandler, big increase again. So again, those, those numbers, though, the right side of that graph is kind of taken off like a shot. Uh, we do see a five-year total of $1.2 billion. It's 25.8% increase. Uh, they do need bond funds to, to fully fund their, the rest of their CIP. Um, as I, I read through their CIP, uh, they do still have a little bit of money left in their 27, 2007, and 2021 bond uh, elections. So they're still kind of chewing through those. This is another graph straight from the CIP document. Where are they spending the money? Again, it's water and wastewater and transportation. 
streets and traffic, water and wastewater, those are very consistent uh, with municipalities. That's where they are spending their money. Town of Queen Creek. We did not have any CIP uh, documents before 2018. So I don't know if they just didn't produce them or if they just weren't required to because they don't have to until they hit a certain size limit. Um, but really in 2018, was it kind of on our radar? Like, yeah, we picked them up. Last year, they kind of came out of nowhere. I believe they had almost 100% increase in their five-year total. So really 2022, they kind of popped out of nowhere to us, you know, the, to kind of look at everything. Uh, so monster increase. Uh, nearly nearly 100%, nearly doubling their program. Uh, and so this year they are increasing again. It just doesn't look like, you know, such a spectacular percentage uh, growth year over year. So they are clearing a billion dollars. Uh, last year's total was 972. I, I'm sorry, I didn't update that one number. It is over a billion dollars uh, this year. And they do have the first year spend at over 600 million. So that's a lot. A little bit different here. They are not spending a ton on water and wastewater. So kind of interesting, a little bit unique. As I mentioned, most municipalities are dedicating enormous percentage of funding towards water and wastewater. Queen Creek, high growth area, they're really looking at public safety, parks, and transportation. Those are their, the areas that they're spending a lot of their, their uh, excuse me, their, their capital funding. Here again, here's another note from Queen Creek. This is lifted just direct from their, from their capital improvement program. And Maricopa County, so again, we're waiting on the final book. Uh, we do have to kind of total these up ourselves. So we are looking at just a billion dollars, just, I say just, because it's you know, down significantly. Uh, we did clear over 1.6 billion last year in their five-year total. We're totaling this at a billion dollars right now. We do think that's a 37.55% increase. Uh, a couple notes on them, they only pay cash. So they, they do not go after financing or bond funding for their capital programs. Uh, the interesting one is I found one reserve fund, you know, it's kind of noted. Uh, we don't include that in the total just because that's how we've always looked at it. They have over a billion dollars in a reserve fund. So I don't know if they're just waiting to define those projects, if they're kind of waiting for, I don't know, I don't work at the county. I, I'd have to, you know, dig a little bit deeper on that one. Um, but the county does have funding. They have, they have cash. They have reserves. They have huge reserves of over, like I said, over a billion dollars. Um, but that's not kind of kind of allocated into actual capital funds yet. Here's one. They're a little bit tricky to read. Um, it's not a huge capital, you know, it's not a long document, um, but they call them just different fund series. So the big one here, transportation. So very similar to other municipalities. That is one of your major food groups. Uh, Maricopa County does have really cool projects when they come out with, you know, justice projects with a lot of public safety, a lot of courtroom projects, a lot of jail or detention type um, projects. So a little bit unique. They're the ones that have those types of projects more than others. Um, and again, transportation, that's where they spend their money. Uh, procurement analysis. So I am almost done. That was our top 10 capital programs. Uh, and then recently, I wanted to share some work that I just did a couple weeks ago on procurement. So as I mentioned, there are sunsets baked into titles 28 and 34. Uh, and so I looked at kind of our history on what we have on procurement. Uh, so I did have a thousand different projects. So individual projects that we keep track of in our database, uh, they had to be valued at 5 million or more, had to go through a public procurement process. And then I kind of looked at where do we, how do we, how do we procure these? Uh, what method of delivery? So what do we use? We really prefer CMR. Kind of across the board, uh, municipalities, local and state municipalities really prefer CMAR. So from a six year time period from 2017 to 2023, all types of public projects, whether they are K-12, whether they are uh, local government, so cities, towns, counties, uh, state government, ADOT included, all of, our, all of our transportation, everything that was publicly procured, uh, kind of those major projects, 61% by volume did go uh, CMAR. So that's our volume that we use a uh, construction manager at risk. Only 14% went design build and then a full 25% went um, hard bid or low bid. Kind of breaking that down just a little bit further, here's your, your horizon over time. So public procurements again from 2017 to 2023, uh, how did we allocate those? Really again, it's a lot of, of construction manager at risk. Uh, design build, I'll show you on the next slide. Uh, design build, we do use occasionally, so not a ton of um, design build opportunities. And then really interesting thing I wanted to point out on this slide specifically, uh, hard bid really had a resurgence in 2023. 
So very interesting to me. I think that was because of all the ARPA money. So all of our federal stimulus money coming into our local municipalities. Uh, some of it came with requirements to use design, or I'm sorry, low bid. Uh, so that was kind of one of the big things that I saw. It was just especially in 2023, a lot of hard bid projects came back out. Interesting thing here. So I did break it down by uh, type of project. So horizontal versus vertical. So vertical, obviously anything with a building structure, horizontal, anything that's ground and down. So things like roadways, parks, utility projects, water and wastewater, those to me would all be considered horizontal. Uh, and you can kind of see the really fun ones. We do not like to hard bid anything with a building structure, you know, across the state. Uh, it's just a kind of anecdotal. We really don't want to do those via hard bid. That's not how all of our municipalities, all of our school districts, state organizations really don't want to do that. Uh, and then interesting thing, the horizontal on design build, those are really two big projects. That's your I-10 Broadway curve and your I-17. Technically, they're P3s. But because it does include the design and construction in one contract, we consider those design builds. Um, but that's the bulk of the design build uh, opportunities or kind of contracts that went horizontal were the two major highway expansion projects. So kind of interesting things there. Um, really fun to look at this kind of stuff. And with that, I have just a couple outlook statements, and then I will turn it over to our panel. Uh, a couple of notes on kind of the overall market. We think pricing has probably hit its peak. So as we start to see, we're starting to see commodities prices come down. Um, I actually think competition is going to kind of shift over to the public side. We do think private development demand is starting to kind of ease. Like spec industrial is starting to kind of not falter by any means, but onesie twosies, like the little anecdotal, oh, they couldn't get their financing. Oh, the bank kind of reneged on the deal that we had there. Um, that happens most often, I think, in spec industrial and multifamily. So multifamily, so much demand. Those projects are moving forward, but they're taking a little longer. So that might be a, an early indication. We do think pricing has probably hit its peak for now, uh, barring any other you know, shock to the system. Uh, and then the really big one is I've seen a really, really incredible kind of, you know, just sophistication coming from the public side and the private side. You know, owners have gotten so responsive and so creative and so proactive. Uh, and then a really interesting thing, Town of Gilbert, uh, they spoke at our event back in April, and she says they actually paused a project in, in the chaos of all these market conditions, right? You know, commodities prices going crazy, you know, can't get material, can't get labor, all these other things, they paused. And I think they took a six month pause on one of their big projects and they it was it was the right move. So it was kind of interesting that, you know, that generally that would go against conventional wisdom, right? You know, secure materials early, get your POs in, negotiate, you know, longer lead time items. Uh, they actually just put a full pause on a project and that was the right move. So I do think there, there's an incredible level of sophistication. Um, it's a known condition, right? Materials are harder to get. Some of them are taking very long. Um, those kinds of things, it's, I'll call it chaos or constraints in the market. Uh, all those different things are requiring such an increased level of coordination, sophistication, more proactive planning. And I think that we've seen that across the board. So on the public side of the municipalities, on the private side, you know, design firms are, are, are staying ahead of these things. They're trying to stay up on pricing and trying to communicate that so much better. Um, contractors are, are trying to negotiate and just, it's a lot more work, right? <laughs> so it's a risky business, uh, but there are a ton of opportunities. And with that, I will conclude my portion of the presentation. Again, you do get the link, uh, or I'm sorry, you do get the slide. So uh, if there's anything interesting in here, uh, you will get the slide. Uh, and thank you so much for listening and paying attention. And then I would like to turn it over to the panel. So like I said, anything I say is completely trumped by the actual owners of our panel. Uh, and so Jamie, I'd like to invite you to turn your camera on and your microphone on. And then our panel. Uh, panelists, please do turn your cameras on and your microphones on. And Jamie Blickman is going to be our moderator today for our exact top three owners uh, in the state. So Jamie Blickman, founder and CEO of Lokahi. I didn't even practice Lokahi Traffic Engineering, uh, certified DBE, woman-owned business. And Jamie, take it away. Please do introduce your panel and have at it. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, that was an awesome presentation that really shows us that there's so much money out there in the state of Arizona that's so exciting for our industry and during these times. 
Um, I'm super excited about these three panelists who's going to share with us about the top three CIP project, uh, programs out there today. So first off, we have Paul Patain with ADOT, Multimodal Planning Division Director. We have Kenny Knudsen, City of Phoenix, Director of Street Transportation. And we have Allison Kimku with City of Scottsdale, Assistant City Engineer. So we will start off today with Paul. Show us the money. Can you share with us what's going on in ADOT? You bet. Uh, good morning, everyone. And thanks for, for having me today. And so let me pull up my uh, the presentation here. Can you guys hear me OK? So is the is the presentation up? Yes, it is. We can Thank see you. it. All right. Let me move a couple of things around here. Great. So thanks for, for having me to, uh, today. And my name is Paul Patnay, as was mentioned earlier by Jamie. I'm, I'm with the, the Multimodal Planning Division. So I'm just going to highlight some of our um, you know highlight our some of our projects within the uh, the five year um, transportation construction program, which was recently adopted by the transportation board in, in June of this year. Our, our program is an annual program that gets updated and approved by the board. So this uh, the first slide here is just the the, the total throughout the FY24 through FY28. As you can see, some of our, our funding sources are the state highway fund. We have financing mechanisms such as bonds, but bulk of our, our funding is, is from, um, is federal formula funding. And so, you know, these total here is over a little over $7.7 .7 billion in the five-year program. But as Rebecca mentioned earlier, our, our program has recently received, um, you know, through um, congressional directed spending and legislative appropriation, we, we call those earmarks, earmark projects. And so over the last couple of years, um, you know, we've seen, you know, well over close to $2 billion in, in earmarks for the state of Arizona. And so those projects, um, you know, they, some of those we have to administer and some of those funds are, are just passed through funds to the locals but the earmarks have really taken off the last couple of years and and really provided a boost to, to projects to, throughout arizona so um this slide here kind of shows the, the dollar amount excluding maricopa and pima counties um back to the the total here of, of these these within the the fiscal year a portion of this, like 37% of this goes to the Maricopa County Association of Governments regions, MAG, and also around approximately 13% of this total here goes to um, um, the Pima Association, Pima Association of Governments, which is PAG. So those, those come right off the top. And this is what is left for Greater Arizona. So we have close to you know, as steady increase throughout the, the next five years, which is a good thing, but, you know, approaching a uh, billion dollars for Great Arizona, uh, which is a good thing. So we further break this down for the ADOT system only because a significant portion of which I'll show on the next slide goes to what we call the, the local, local program as well. So these are um, the, the amounts for the next five years, we, we break it down into the green is preservation, which is, you know, mainly uh, preserving our capital investments such as bridge and, and pavement projects. Then we have modernization, statewide modernization in the red. Those are like um, spot improvements, signal, signal, signalized intersections, things to just uh, increase traffic flow and operations. Then we have state statewide project development. That's for staff, for our consulting community to deliver the program. Then we have planning, statewide planning efforts, followed up by the blue, which is expansion for, for Greater Arizona at um, 182 million for this year. So the local program, you know, this is something that, that really keep an eye on is the local program has really increased over, you know, with the, um, with IIJA. 
And some of these are because of the new programs associated with IIJA. And some of those new programs are the, the transportation alternatives. You got the National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure, the NEVI program, and also they've increased um, um, funding amounts for um, like our off system bridge program has increased, um, seen an increase in funding along with our highway safety improvement program alone. We've um, added additional 20 million for each of the five years in the program related to um, highway safety improvements. So kind of a overall breakdown of, of the three categories of funding and these three categories of funding are, are um, they're in alignment with our long range our current long range tra transportation plan where we have funding in expansion modernization and preservation as you can see that the biggest piece of the pie continues to be you know preserving our um, our existing infrastructure assets because our assets are, you know, for the state are well over $24 billion and it's important for us, you know, like anything else to, to maintain those, um, those assets to, to will really be in good condition. And so something new within the five-year program, the presentation as the link to the program is this year we listed all the, the local projects. So, you know, a person looking to see what's happening in Arizona as, as far as location, can easily navigate through the, the five-year program to see where some of the upcoming projects are. Then some of our, our bigger expansion project is, as mentioned earlier as well, is the, the I-10. This is the gap project from the, the 202 to the, to the 387. And so we're, we're looking to, um, to get this one on their way. We're doing a design build, but we, we still got a good year or so to get through the, the right-of-way acquisition process along with the, the NEPA. But this this is the number one project for, for the agency and just improving the facility to where, um, you know, we got the, uh, the, the section from the 202 to Riggs Road. We're, we're looking at um, adding additional general purpose lane along with HOV lanes. But once we get um, near Riggs Road, We'll, we'll go back down to just three general purpose lanes plus the shoulders. These are some of our other expansion projects in FY24 throughout the state. Uh, a lot of focus is on US 93. We also have, uh, you know, the, the current I-17 project. Then we got a, um, on US 191, Cochise Railroad overpass at 41.3 million. But our bigger projects are on um, the Kane, you know, the US 93 in Kane Springs. And we have a, a really huge project on I 40, the US 93, the system, system interchange coming in at around 160 million. And for FY25, uh, our focus is on the Again, US 93, Mr. Royale, Big Jim Wash expansion project. These are taking rural two lane facilities to, um, to four lane divided facilities. Then there's a lot happening on, on State Route 347. I'm sure a lot of you heard, have seen the news articles, and, and ADOS received a lot of uh, letters of concern, emails, all the above where um, you know, traffic, you know, that, that trip from I-10 to, to Maricopa is experiencing some significant delays and in, in traffic operational concerns. And so we're looking for significant investments over the next um, several years on the 347 corridor. Then just to touch on the airport capital improvement program, because um, there's quite a bit of work there as well. This kind of highlights the, um, the work through throughout the five-year program. And we typically focus just on the, the, the fiscal year 24. And also within the program is the listing of all the projects with, with the airport, associated airport. So depending on your location, where you do your, a lot of your business, you can kind of isolate and find um, if there's any um, projects that, um, you know, eligible for, for your trade. Then these are um, the state local projects. Those are typical like capital improvements and um, the, the 
Arizona, the APMS program toward the bottom there, those are just um, like preservation types projects on, on the runway type facilities. Then as mentioned earlier, you know, there is, um, you know, we do get increased dollars, but you know, the, the cost, of do, cost of doing business is also rising, you know, not, not just in construction materials, you know, labor wages, you know, all the above has increased. And so we do see additional dollars, but unfortunately some of that is, is taken away by the, the increase in, of cost of, of doing business. And so that kind of wraps up this little portion of, of my presentation, but um, the, I got the links here for upcoming projects that we're currently advertisement, both with our, um, for capital construction projects and also with our engineering consultant section, along with, um, you know, the Arizona procurement portal, which um, is another resource for upcoming projects. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Well, that's a lot of great information. Um, we are going to move on to the city of Phoenix with the largest city CIP program. Kenny, can you share with us what's going on in Phoenix? Good morning. I hope everybody can hear me okay and you can see my screen. Uh, so there yes. is a lot going on. Set. You can? Yes, good. we're good. All right. So, uh, um, we want to just start talking a little bit about what's going on with our CIP. Um, as uh, Rebecca noted, we did cross a major plateau coming up here, uh, this current five-year CIP we have going. So uh, I would always encourage anybody who's interested in knowing more about our capital improvement program. Um, it is lengthy, but um, it has the individual projects listed in there that you might be interested in, but um, it's available on our phoenix.gov uh, website. Uh, you see here the cover sheet of the CIP program. This is the uh, major table that kind of everybody flows to to kind of see how everything looks through the city. Uh, and this goes through our major uh, capital improvement programs throughout the entire city. And you see the big number at the bottom, which is $10 uh, billion. And that is a first for us. Uh, never happened before, uh, but uh, it's a it's a great uh, sign that there's a lot of stuff going on in the city of Phoenix. But when you look at that, there's made the three major capital improvement program departments are um, you first you have you have aviation. There's comes in just shy of two billion dollars over that five year period. Um, streets, which is my department, we are just crossed over a one billion dollars. Um, we we hadn't uh, had a that's that's an increase from over from last year. And then uh, the, the big uh, CIP throughout our entire city is our water and wastewater program that's just over $3.2 billion. And that is actually a slight decrease from our last five-year CIP program, uh, most likely due to a lot of the wrap of the drought um, um, projects that were going on, uh, and also some increase in costs that they were dealing with as well um, from inflationary. So that's a little bit of a, a look at our CIP program. Now talking a little bit about our street transportation department and some of the, the projects that might be coming up. And this is not a summary of all of them. It's just a highlight of a few of them. And there is a kind of flavor to them. And you'll see a lot of them are related to federal funding that we've pursued and been successful in getting grants from the IIJ and the bipartisan infrastructure law. Uh, so one of the, we'll start out here with some design projects. We had uh, received about, uh, $25 million from the federal government for a raise program um, back about a year and a half ago. And uh, that is a bridge over the Rio Salado along with some pathway improvements along the river. Uh, we're gonna be going out for design on that shortly. Um, also, we had some, we're successful in getting Chrissy grants um, from the federal government as well for two railroad crossings. You see those as well. So we're gonna be going out for design on those two projects as well. Uh, moving over to the construction side, uh, I will always, let you know they're not just on the federal side, but we have a lot of effort. And you can see from my background here that road safety is a big um, uh, focus area for the city of Phoenix right now. Uh, so we have $10 million annually that we are spending on uh, roadway safety improvement programs. Uh, another federal grant program that we had received back at the um, beginning of the pandemic was our build grant for the 35th Avenue safety corridor. We're gonna be moving towards construction later this fiscal year on that. So that'll be going out to bid. Um, our Happy Valley Road project that will also be going out to bid. That's a federally funded project, but also uses Prop 400 monies as well. Um, that is a major road improvement project between 67th Avenue and 35th Avenue that will be coming out to bid later this year as well. 
Uh, and then another uh, type type of project we've been doing is working on multi-use paths along our canal, um, you know, system of canals in the city of Phoenix. Uh, we are getting ready to, we'll be ready later, later this fiscal year of going out to bid for our Western Canalscape project, which is uh, from the end of the, light, the South Central light rail uh, line that ends at Central Avenue baseline all the way over to 24th Street, which is South Mountain Community College. This is just a few of the, the, the opportunities that will be coming up here from a construction standpoint. Um, and one thing I just want to make sure that everybody understands is we are actively as a city uh, going after as many opportunities that we feel eligible for that we can be competitive for under the IIJA and the BI, um, the bill program. That is a five year program. Uh, and as these uh, notice of funding of opportunities come out, we have a team of city staff who meet bi weekly to go over as those come out talk about what are, we're going to be competitive, what we're going to be submitting for. So City of Phoenix is very, very active in pursuing any available um, uh, programs as they come out from the federal government. And we're monitoring those constantly. So I, the list up here is not a complete list, but these are the ones even just my department has been uh, working on. Uh, raised grant, we've got a no Oh, a notice of funding of opportunity coming out here probably in the next month or two. Uh, Safe streets and roads for all. We actually submitted a $25 million grant request just uh, last month. Uh, bridge investment program. We uh, have submitted for one of those in the past, and we're going to be looking at submitting another one when, those, when that comes out again. Reconnecting communities, another great program that we're going to be uh, submitting a, a, a grant and application for, I think, later in September. I think it's due at the end of September. Uh, smart grant program, we were successful in getting, out, getting about $1.2 million for uh, smart traffic signal technology projects with that. Uh, and then the PROTECT grant uh, is another one we are pursuing as well for um, our Levine Area Conveyance Channel doing some improvements along there. So that's just a, a, a few of the things we're doing, but we are very, very active and very, very focused on making sure we get any, avail any available opportunities as possible from the federal uh, infrastructure funding. Another exciting thing happening with the City of Phoenix is our uh, general obligation bond program. Program. We have not had a geo bond program since 2006. So if you're doing the math on that 17 years, um, and usually you try to do these every five years, but because of economy and some other stuff that were going on over the last 17 years, we have not been able to go out. Uh, we have a $500 million bond that's coming out this November, election day is November 7th. Uh, if you are uh, a Phoenix resident registered to vote, I would encourage you to make your voice heard. Uh, this is something that will take forward our uh, infrastructure program here at the city of Phoenix going that, and I mentioned that $10 billion five-year CIP is, does not include this 500 million yet, but our next uh, CIP going forward will include the fire 500 million, hopefully if everything goes well with the election in November. So uh, there's a number of different areas of programs and projects in here between fire station, park facilities, community centers, uh, I've got a lot of uh, about $81 million of streets and storm drain projects that are going to be um, tasked by my department to be able to fulfill and implement uh, if we're successful here. So uh, this is something we're very excited about. Just be And the idea here is to keep it a lot smaller, even though we haven't done this for 17 years, is to keep it at $500 million. The idea is to be able to do this every five years as we should be doing. Uh, so that's just something to know about City of Phoenix. Um, I know Rebecca talked a little bit about the Prop 400 extension. I know we've been all living this kind of uh, drama that's been going on for probably the last couple of years. And I think we're all very happy that we're, we reached the end of one portion of that. And we're excited for um, November 2024 when this will be coming back to voters uh, to be able to extend a very successful transportation tax that has built our transportation network here in the Valley since 1986. And uh, so we're very excited about it. We have, um, from the city of Phoenix perspective, we have public transit projects in there. We have freeway projects and we also have arterial um, street projects as well. I know there might, we might get into that a little bit later in the discussion, but this is something we're close, following closely. And it is something that is very, very important to us to make sure this five cent, half cent sales tax continues for the next 20 years. Um, also, as Rebecca noted, uh, the alternative project delivery methods uh, the sunset coming up here, um, uh, depending on which title you're looking at, that's something we're following very, very closely. We will be very much involved in uh, the group that's working on any legislation to be able to extend that sunset date and any changes to the alternative project delivery method program. But I will tell you to successfully execute the $10 billion CIP that we have on the books, we have to have CM, construction manager risk. We have to have design build programs. And most important, I think for me, uh, for what we do is job order contracting. That is 
the lifeblood of what we do as the city of Phoenix. We have so much work that goes out through JOC um, and, and it provides a lot of opportunities for a lot of firms to get in, in their foot in the door to do business with the city as well. So uh, that's something we're very close, following very closely and uh, hopefully we will get to a successful resolution to get that sense that uh, either eliminated or extended out uh, for the foreseeable future. Uh, finally, uh, getting to the end here is uh, we are um, at the city of Phoenix. Uh, our council has voted to consider a prevailing wage for the city of Phoenix, would that be effective on any construction projects in the city of Phoenix? That's something we haven't decided on exactly how we're going to do it, but we will be having a number of outreach opportunities to be able to determine how we move forward with that. And our intent is to, before the end of the calendar year to be able to bring something back for our council to consider when it comes to prevailing wages um, for our construction projects. That's important to note. That's, we, that's something we have not done or established in the past. And then finally, this is the last piece here is how do you get um, to know about what the work is going on in the city of Phoenix? How do you get notice of opportunities? Uh, if you are not already a subscriber to our newsletter, please, please, please get on our subscriber list. That's where all of our opportunities, design, construction, planning, whatever is going out, that's where you find out all the information about it. So uh, that is my biggest uh, advice I'd give to you. Make sure you know what's happening in city of Phoenix because $10 billion of CIP, there's no way you can memorize every single one of those projects. Uh, so you've got to be able to have a way to, uh, to, to know about it in this newsletter and let you know about those opportunities. And that uh, concludes my part of the presentation and I'll stick around for Q&A, obviously. Um, turn back over to Jamie. Yeah, thank you, Kenny. That was a lot of great information and I'm on your newsletter and get it every week and it just takes seconds to scan through it, but it gives you the latest and greatest, definitely. I'm super excited also to hear how you're actively participating in federal dollars for us to make sure we're getting the most of them. So I'm sure we're all happy to hear that. Um, okay, so on to Allison. Um, share with us what's going on in Scottsdale. Okay, thank you. Um, Allison Timkew, city engineer for the city of Scottsdale. And I'll just kind of quickly go through my slides. Um, is everybody seeing my screen here? Yeah. Okay, great. So first of all, I'm just going to start with an outline. I'm just going to quickly go over our staff and our organization and then our CIP development and some changes. Then I'm going to go through a few projects upcoming and um, then at the end I'll provide contact and website information. So first, this is our organization of the city of Scottsdale and uh, capital projects, which is the which is my department. We administer all the design and construction for capital projects throughout the city, and we are within the public works department. So this shows the public works organization. We have our administration and then under it is our facilities department, our fleet, solid waste, capital projects, and then streets and transportation. And then this is the organization of my department, capital project management. We did actually go through a real organization last year and we've broken up our project management team into three different groups or pods. And we have a principal project manager now over each group. We have three groups. One is over water, one is over streets and one is over buildings. So that's a new organizational structure for our department. And then this shows our 23-24 CIP at $1.4 billion. I think kind of the trend that Rebecca was stating with other municipalities, um, the bulk of ours is in water as well as transportation with smaller pieces in community facilities, drainage, preservation, public safety, and then our service facilities. And then this shows our sources of funds, um, water and wastewater again, um, one of the highest pieces, it's an enterprise, all the projects funded by water, wastewater rates and development fees. Then aviation, um, my department doesn't actually manage the aviation projects, but aviation also is an enterprise fund and they have user fees, lease fees, and then they leverage a lot of FAA grants for their projects. For street projects, we have our 0.2% transportation sales tax. And then in 2018, we have the voter approved 0.1% um, increase. 
We uh, use a lot of MAG Prop 400 regional sales tax. So we're also very um, looking forward to uh, 400E passing, hopefully, in the election. And then uh, we also utilize federal grants and intergovernmental agreements. For preserve projects, we do have a city sales tax for land acquisition and amenities. And um, our taxes, actually, one of our taxes is, is expiring in 2025. And we're currently going through um, a task force now to see what, we're, what our plans are for the future. Um, for preserve tax and then drainage, we have the Maricopa County Flood Control District. We have inter intergovernmental intergovernmental agreements that we leverage. And then we do have a four, $4.95 per month stormwater fee for our drainage projects. Tourism projects, we uh, utilize our bed tax and revenue from the Princess Hotel, um, parks, libraries, community centers, police and fire. These are all general fund projects. We also have a lot of our 2019 voter approved um, bond that uh, was passed and we have 319 million of general obligation bonds to fund 58 projects within that bond 2019 program. Then issues, I know we've been talking about inflation. Um, this just shows uh, month over month, uh, the statistics from the US Bureau of Labor Statistics. Um, again, we're all aware of the inflation, um, 18 consecutive months. It does look like the it's fallen below 10% in the last three months, which um, is might be good for the horizon of inflation on our projects, but much of our new available funds for our CIP are actually is actually going towards existing projects. So we don't have a huge list of new projects for this year because we're trying to fund um, increases on projects that we already have that are active. So our 45.8 million five year program for paving has become an $84.7 million program. And we added uh, 50 million of general funds to fund 10 bond projects that were originally funded with 70 million in bond funding. And then of our 162 million added budget and water wastewater, 103 million of that goes is going to go towards existing projects. So new projects, we do have a few new projects in the FY2324 CIP. We have some that are general fund. Um, they, it, excluding technology projects and those that are under a million dollars. These are the four projects that we have. We, had a shade, we have a shade and tree um, development plan and implementation. We're gonna go out actually for that um, RFQ to hire for um, a master plan to figure out the plan and the standards for that project. We have target hardening of Scottsdale facilities. We have Kiva modernization, which is our city hall and that's primarily a technology project. And then at Pima Park, we do we are planning on building eight new pickleball courts that was um, approved this year. And then tourism fund, uh, we're currently working on the West World Polo Field Lighting, which is a new project this year. We're replacing the West World Tent. Um, currently working on that. We do have some trail enhancements. Scottsdale Stadium, these two projects are going to be part of the current project that's under design and CMAR um, for our uh, phase two of our Scottsdale Stadium improvements. And then for our transportation fund, 2% um, fund, we have the 68th Street Sidewalk Project, which is new this year from Arizona Canal to Camelback. And if you quickly look down to the next category in the stormwater fund, we also have um, a storm drain project for that same section of Camelback Road. So those two projects will be combined. We have a bridge repair at Doubletree Ranch. We have some intersection improvements and we have some Indian Ben wash path renovations. Um, back, jumping back down to stormwater, we have the granite reef wash phase 2B project, which um, we currently just awarded uh, that contract for design. The rawhide wash flood control district projects are under design and construction. And then our Riata wash flood control project is currently under design. 
Um, and then in our water and wastewater enterprise, we have a couple of new projects. And again, 52 million was added to our water distribution system improvements program. And then um, we have some of our smaller projects listed here as well. So for upcoming solicitations for design, we do have the Scottsdale Road section from Dixaletta to Carefree Highway that will be advertised this year. We have a 30 inch transmission main and pump station improvements in the Crossroad East area that will be coming out for solic solicitation this year. We currently have a CMAR solicitation that's out on the street right now and it closes on August 28th. And that's for the TPC sewer project. We have, um, some uh, CWT GAC filter under drain replacement and water campus line feed that will be CMAR upcoming this year. Design build, we currently are about to issue a solicitation for this project and it's installing solar systems at both our Civic Center um, campus as well as our City Hall parking lot. Again, that's anticipated to be advertised very soon. Low bid opportunities. We are we do have a federally funded project that uh, we're being um, administering through our CA pro program with ADOT, and that's the Scusa Road sec section from Joe Max to Dixaletta. We anticipate um, advertising that for bid in this fall, and then our PM10 pave of unpaved roads that also has some federal funds, and we are anticipating to um, bid that later this year. Job order contract opportunities, and just like um, City of Phoenix had mentioned, we have a very robust job order contract program, and um, obviously we're going to be keeping a close eye on the sunset as well, because that would impact kind of the way we've been doing a lot of work um, for the last five or so years. Um, in our job order contract specifically, we did change limits on some of ours because again, we were reaching limits uh, faster with inflation. So we did increase our water infrastructure limits, our water treatment infrastructure limit, our water treatment limits, our civil site um, per job and annual limits. And then we have a couple that are set to expire, um, contracts set to expire um, water April 2025 and site civil April 2026. So those would be resolicited. And then uh, we just recently solicited for our citywide pool um, projects, and that will be awarded at City Council next week. That's been a really robust JOC for us, as well as several other municipalities have tagged on to that JOC. Um, so it's been a very well used contract. And then we also have a lot of on call um, contracts as well, and we have some upcoming on call consulting opportunities actually the first one listed here is the architecture ar architectural um, solicitation and that actually just closed so we're going through the selection process on that. Our electrical one will be going out hopefully later this month and then we'll be soliciting for our structural um, later this fall. And then again, here's my contact information. And for more information on our proposed 23-24 budget, it's actually adopted, but it's still listed on our website as proposed until they actually update the budget book. So uh, this link will bring you to our um, proposed 23-24 budget. And then the second link will bring you to our adopted budget book. Um, the new one, again, should be posted very soon. The link here will take you to the 22-23 book until the new one is posted. And that's all I had, thank you. Thank you, Allison. Well, we certainly heard a lot of information here today. Um, there's a lot going on. Um, I wanted to kind of change up some of our questions and I'm hoping that this is a, a question that brings value to what I think our audience is here um, on, on this call. Um, being the fact that there are a lot of DBEs, small businesses, um, I kind of wanted to ask a question. Um, well, see, hearing all that you guys have to share, it can be somewhat intimidating if we're not, if we're new to the market, right? To those of us who've been around, it's something that just kind of, we get it, but there's a lot that can intimidate us. So I would like to ask you, you know, and a lot of times we also hear it's the same, we see the same firms getting the same projects. 
um, you know, mind you, they are, they, they're probably very good and that's why they're getting it. But to somebody who's new, a new firm out there, a small firm out there, how do we do business with you? What are the people, what are the folks that are there new firms that have recently contracted with you? If so, what are they doing right? I know that's a tricky question. <laughs> um, Paul, do you want to answer first sure, on that one? You, you bet. I'll, I'll take the first dive at it and, and <laughs> thank you. Um, so yeah, we are in talking with staff. We, we are seeing some some new firms in, in our in our P three contracts. Okay, but to me, you know, one of the biggest things that the the firm has to do is, you know, you have to market your firm. You know, you want to let people know, you know, what services you offer, and also, um, you know, the networking. You know, that comes with the marketing is networking, getting your name out there, and what uh, type of business and, and trade you provide. Then you know you. You know, you know, getting, <clears throat> being prepared and, and, and doing um, and being proactive and, and, you know, putting the time in to research all these uh, available opportunities, you know, like Kenny just showed his newsletter, things like that, you know, you, you know, go ahead and, and subscribe to it. That way you're, you're, you're getting these opportunities and also, um, you know, stay informed you know from all the organizations not just city of phoenix you know allison provided a pretty good really good update on what's happening in the city of scottsdale scottsdale then we also have all the all the work that adot is is coming up with as well so thank you thank you paul kenny you want to jump in there and share your thoughts sure uh thanks jamie I think the one thing we've seen a couple things just over the last few years, I, I think there's a lot of uh, firms that might be newer to the, to, to the city, we've seen that, or even just some things of, you know, firms have been purchased by other firms and there's been acquisitions and things like that. So there's a lot of new names, maybe or different people attached to the names that we've had there. Um, but what I always kind of tell people is like, it's great, you can come talk to me um, about getting work with the city of Phoenix, but I don't sit on it. I don't sit on panels. So when we're doing selection panels for a design consultant or a construction, you know, a manager at risk, I'm not sitting on those panels. Um, I think the best thing you need to that, that I recommend you know, firms to do is reach out to some of the, the 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 middle managers, the people who might be managing water or wastewater projects, or the folks, staff who are managing those folks or even an aviation department or street transportation department, or even in our city engineer's office, there's a lot of different areas that you can focus in on getting and, and to know people. And, and that's important. You always need to have kind of an idea. So when somebody sees somebody at an interview or they're reading an SOQ and see a name, hey, I know that person. And I know they did this project over here and they, they do some good work here. So it's those are the kind of things that you want to be able to have that recognition there. And that really is a, a job that never stops. Um, and, and I think it's even more important now because just be since the pandemic, the last three plus years, there's been a lot of turnover in staff, not just around in the market, but even in city um, organizations. So the people you might have worked with in the past are no longer there. They might move on to a different job or position. And so I think it's always incumbent to kind of reach out and try to know who you know is is in, in charge of those projects who's going to be working on those but also to introduce yourself and where you might fit in especially if there's something new with your organization that you used to be called this and now you're called this and that's the, you're the same people but you're just um you know you're, you're just from acquisitions and things like that i think that's always a good thing but even with the smaller firms i would say there's two things i would i would suggest specifically also is um, just like a lot of the other um, agencies out there, we have an on-call for design consultants or, or professional engineering consultants. So that's a good way to be able to get your foot in the door. We do this every two years. Um, and so there are two-year contracts we have in place to be able to do on-call projects that are you know, at a moment's notice. Those are typically smaller and those something you can get your foot in the door rather easy. Um, we have a number of probably more than 90 JOC contracts across 20 plus disciplines. So those are the types of projects as well, smaller types of projects that a smaller firm can get their foot in the door either as a prime, um, you know, and those things and they can work their way up to a larger project working either a sub or a prime. Um, that's always something good to do so you can get that kind of name recognition and that experience working on a project. And you know, it's like you said, you, you, you do well with the small stuff, then you're going to earn the opportunity to be able to do well on the larger, larger projects. And then the last thing I'd probably say is see who is getting work. 
see what firms are getting work. And if you're in the subcontractor capacity, go reach out to those firms and talk with them. Hey, I'm interested in doing city work, but I know you're very successful that I would love to be able to help support you on this project as a sub or a supplier or whatever it might be. So there's different ways to tackle that and approach that. Um, yeah, you, you don't want to try to you know, eat that elephant all at once. You got to do it one bite at a time and trying to different strategies to be able to be successful. So that's kind of what I'd recommend from City of Phoenix perspective. Awesome, thank you. It's a lot of good information and it shows that there are a lot of avenues. Um, we just have to be uh, willing to step out and do our work. Um, Allison, yeah, um, share with I, us your thoughts. Yeah, <laughs> I'm actually going to agree with uh, most of what Keeney said. Yeah. Um, for example, our architectural on-call, like I said, we had just solicited, we received 24 submittals. So um, that's a huge pool of people interested in working for the city. And we normally select three architectural on-calls. I'm not sure if we'll be selecting more this time, but we're looking for a proven track record. And it not, doesn't necessarily mean a proven track record with the city of Scottsdale, but in other municipalities. And we're looking for, especially with the on-call, well, especially with our JOC program, um, we are looking for contract uh, contractors who have experience in JOCs. So it is good to show us your experience with other municipalities. But again, um, like Keeney had suggested, if you have the capability to be a subcontractor to get your name recognition out there, and um, so we can have some experience working with you, that's also super helpful. I'm also not sitting on panels, so um, a lot of engineers and contractors reach out to me directly, but uh, it is a good idea to get exposure with our principal project managers who are managing um, the project managers and projects as well. So that, that would be my advice. Awesome, I think that, that definitely is such great. I think I've seen them actually on websites, right? Yeah, there are some, you know, those would mainly, I, I would say our major um, project management groups um, are our, first is our aviation department. They have a separate uh, organizational structure under Candace Huff, who is the deputy director over the design and construction services division uh, and water and wastewater. That's a pretty large organization, but they have deputy directors who oversee the water and wastewater side. Uh, then in uh, street transportation, our um, deputy director over um, design and construction is Ruben Lolly. Uh, and then you can find the organization under that. We have a design side and a construction side. And then finally, under the office of the city engineer, uh, you've got a vertical project management group uh, led by Chris Kabbalah. And uh, he uh, manages our vertical project management group. So they support public works. Uh, uh, library, police, fire, all those different types of projects. Those are our four major project organizations. So office, city, engineer, streets, uh, aviation, and water, wastewater. So in the, each of those have their own org charts. Uh, and uh, we'll, I would, uh, I'll reach out to each of those areas to see if I can get org charts that maybe I can provide to Rebecca um, to be able to provide to the, the group here. Well, I can say I've been in the Valley for quite a while, um, and I can say it's a it's a very large state. I don't know where everyone on this call is from. It's a very large state, but at the same time, it's a very small community. And because you get to know one person, two people, three people, when you get out there, you realize the community is pretty small, and we can connect the dots pretty quickly. So thanks for all that information. Okay, the next thing I would love to touch on, and then everyone sort of touched on this, was Prop 400E. It's being talked about. Um, we've heard about it for years, and finally... Um, well, and for those of you who don't know what that is, um, out of it's Prop 400E is a regional level half cent sales measure um, designed to fund transportation projects. Um, it finally um, has been signed by the governor, but it still has to go to vote. It will be going to vote in the fall of 2024. Um, so that said, I am curious, why should we support this? Um, what type of projects? Uh, come to life as a result of it? What happens if it doesn't pass? Um, tell us about that. Um, I'm going to start with Kenny. Can you, can you tell us yeah. what happens if it passes? What happens if it doesn't? So I'll put on my regional hat right now and just say, this is, as I kind of mentioned in my comments, this, we've had this two different you know, versions of this. We had 
1986 and again in 2004 this was passed and this is one of those things where you know Maricopa Association of Governments does a fantastic job of managing this fund funding on behalf of the entire region and this is really a partnership all of us cities could go it alone and do something like this on our own but we understand we live in a region, one of the biggest regions, <laughs> metropolitan areas in the entire um, you know, country. And for us to be able to survive, we have to build a and, and continue to build and sustain a transportation network that keeps everything flowing and keeps everything working, uh, whether it's you know from the, our, the freeway network that we've built, whether it's the public transit system that it funds and supports, or even the arterial street projects that we are able to get done with this as well. So it's all those different facets of transportation. That's my, from the regional perspective, it's been successful. So that's, there's not, I, I can't sit there and say that, hey, it was it, ever, we've made any, we've made those mistakes throughout the part. We've, we've earned the right, I think, as a, as a region for this to be able to move forward and be able to keep us moving forward and growing like we all want to grow. Um, but from the city of Phoenix perspective, and I'll, I'll come just from a street transportation perspective, um, I have potentially nine projects in there. Uh, that are street projects, whether they're bridge projects or street improvement projects. And that's about $360 million worth of projects that if this funding doesn't go through, I'm not going to have the opportunity to be able to do those projects, at least at the, at the time frame or the schedule, I'd like to be able to do them. Um, and if you want to know that $360 million, that funding from Prop 400 extension is about $250 million. I still have to come up with about $108 million of that um, locally, but that's an easier lift to, to, to fund those projects if I have that 70% funding coming from regional transportation tax. Uh, and I'm sure there's similar stories that, um, you know, that Allison's going to be able to tell you as well when it comes to the impact of this for Scottsdale. Sir, and can, you, can I follow up with a question of saying, like, what do those projects uh, address? Is it like roadway capacity needs that are going to be needed or, or what is safety or is, is, do you know that far deep into it? So, you know, some... I would say it's a combination. Some of my nine projects that I've got on there are roadways that exist today, but it's, at, it's either adding capacity or, or ability to be able to continue to operate the way it does today. So um, necessary improvements on that. Then other areas where it's, it's building out a roadway to the ultimate capacity. I think of something like a Dobbins Road uh, down in Southwest Phoenix, Levine area, where it's a huge area of growth. Um, the road isn't what it's going to be when it's supposed to what it's supposed to carry um, in its ultimate capacity. I think also 91st Avenue, the, the right now um, it would be building a bridge over 91st Avenue. If you're familiar with what happened over during the the, the fall rains and the winter rains, we had to close down 67th Avenue and 91st Avenue crossings of the river Salt River because of flooding or releases coming from the SRP, you know, watershed. And and so the the idea there is to be able to create a dry crossing then that, that impact to, you know, residents and, and people trying to get across the river there, you know, west of the 202, it's limited because there isn't anything that's a dry crossing. So that's an example of a type of project that's in there as well. Thank you. I think that's really helpful for us as builders to really, as we factor this in and make decisions. Um, Allison, do you want to share with us what happens with and without the 400E passing and not passing? Uh, yeah, uh, similar to um, City of Phoenix, we have a list of projects. We have um, 14 projects that we've identified for ALCP um, under Prop 400E, and the majority of our projects are existing roadways. We're either reconstructing existing roadways or widening existing roadways. We do have one new roadway and we have one new bridge in our list, um, but we're also at $318 million total cost estimate. So about $223 million of that would be regionally funded with about a $96 million local match. So same um, if 400E doesn't pass, it would really hinder the speed that we would be able to get these projects completed. Thank you. And Paul, how does this affect ADOT? Paul, you're muted. Um, thank you. Our, our role is a little bit different with Prop 400 because, um, you know, MAG is responsible for all the, the planning and programming of the funding associated with Prop 400E. So ADOT, ADOT takes on the, the administration role of, of the construction, you know, the, the construction funding. So whatever MAG programs, we, we pretty much, ADOT takes the lead on, on project delivery. But, you know, I, as Kenny mentioned, you know, we've seen what 
the, the past propositions have done to this community. You know, I remember driving up to the Phoenix several years ago where I-10 ended at Dysart Road and you look at it today and it's just, you know, how the, the economy is growing, you know, transportation infrastructure is critical to a successful economy. I think we all know that. So, you know, it's, it's just a, a big plus for everyone if, if the Prop 400E passes. Then, you know, the big component, another component of the prop is the transit services, you know, the transit component, because until I got into, into this, my current position, my role, I didn't realize how important transit is to a lot of these larger communities. This is how people get around to their jobs. This is how, this is their livelihood. Not everybody can afford a new electric vehicle, new car. And so it's huge. Um, you know, it, it'd be a huge success if um, we can get Prop 400E over the table. So. Yeah, couldn't agree more. We definitely want options, right? We right. definitely want to provide transportation options for everyone. Um, okay, so if you have, do you have any, I guess we're short, getting to the end of our time here. So we're just gonna throw it out there. Is there any last minute advice that you would have for any DBE small businesses that are tuning in right now? Um, who wants to go first? I'll, I'll just go. Kenny, Kenny, okay. there you go. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just kind of echo what I said before, as far as just keeping your foot in the door and trying to, trying to, to, to be persistent about that. But I think the first thing is, to know it's it, we're not sitting in a situation where our economy is declining or we don't have these opportunities there is a lot of work going around and i think all of us as public agency owners will sit there and tell you we want as many people interested in our projects as possible and we want as many wide range of confirms working on our projects as well because we don't want to put all our eggs in one basket or a few baskets we want to be able to have a good collection of firms out there to be able to work with um, both on the prime side but on the subcontractor side because a lot of the stuff we work on when we're looking with general you know construction firms the, 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 that's great to have those firms managing those projects but it's the subcontractors who do do the work on, on, on the major components of those projects a lot of the time too. So uh, I would say just keep on plug in um, because there are opportunities available and, and uh, sometimes we just got to be able to you get that one project and that gives you your chance to be able to shine uh, and get make, get noticed and, and, and earn that next project. Yeah, thank you, Kenny. I, I think just from a small business owner, I'd say a unique mask goes a long way. There's always, I mean, Arizona is always very, very open to new ideas, new opportunities, things you've seen elsewhere. So I even think if you're from out of state, um, if you've seen it done elsewhere, that's cool. We, I, I think Arizona is very open to those ideas. So that's sometimes those open, those moments we can walk through doors. Anyway, um, let's move on. Paul, you're unmuted. So it looks like you're ready to answer that oh. question. <laughs> No, I just, you know, competition is good for everybody. So I just encourage um, everybody out there to, you know, to go after your dreams of being successful, you know, don't, you know, just, you know, be all you can be. So, you know, so to speak. And, and there is opportunities, as Kenny mentioned, there's just a lot of, of work everywhere throughout the state. And um, just, you know, um, you know, stay current on, on what's happening, you know, stay connected with, all the various municipalities, either through newsletters or, or just uh, your own doing your own outreach to, to make those connections. That way your, your firm can get on the radar and be successful. Awesome. Thank you. Allison. Yes, I agree um, with what both Paul and Keeney have said. I think that, you know, for smaller, maybe new uh, DBE firms, again, you know, taking advantage of subcontracting opportunities, obviously, to get your name out there, name recognition with the municipality, and then um, to prove basically your abilities on a project as a sub. So then in the next capacity, you could go as a prime. Awesome. Well, thanks so much. Well, I think today I certainly walked away knowing that there is a lot of money. There's a lot of opportunities. Arizona is growing. We know that is not new. We see it in the news everywhere. So this is a great place to be. We certainly appreciate all that you guys have shared here. And we certainly appreciate your time. Um, Rebecca, I don't know if there's anything else to add here. I don't know if you want to wrap this up, but thank you all on this call for your time today. I will echo those thoughts and also add, Jamie, great job moderating. That was really fun. <laughs> 
Way to keep it moving and be adaptable to questions. <laughs> so thank you, panelists, uh, Paul, Allison, Kenny. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, just to wrap it up, everybody gets the slide. So as long as uh, Paul, Kenny, and Allison, as long as you guys are good with distributing them, we will be happy to send them out to all registered attendees. We'll include the link to the recording as well. I did just see Francesca drop the link to the uh, DBE conference, October 3rd and 4th in Tucson. Uh, we will also be doing a follow-up workshop on this topic specifically. So two weeks from today, Tuesday, August 29th, the do's and don'ts of responding to the IFB and RFQ. So it's kind of cool. The panel will be uh, Candy Kowalski from the City of Phoenix, procurement manager. Uh, we've also got Dallas Hammett with WSP. He'll be moderating, and he's got the experience of being the state engineer for ADOT for a long time. So he was excited to like you know flip the flip flip the script a little bit. Uh, so design side, we do have uh, Stevie Botter, I think her name is, with Sand Contracting, and then Brandy Bar. So uh, above above Bar Marketing, but lots of experience creating proposals. So kind of a wide range. Uh, we'll kind of explore all the ins and outs of responding to those RFQs, IFBs from all different perspectives. So now that we know where the money is, we know where the capital programs are, we know how to find them, we know how to find the opportunities. The next step, you know, responding to the RFQ or the IFB. Again, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, we will conclude this meeting at 10.30, uh, right on time. So fantastic job, panelists and moderator, keeping to time. Appreciate <laughs> it. We'll see you all next time. Thank you.